Hi, my name is Beatrix Haggard, and today we're going to go through um, kind of knowing a little bit more about our plants, knowing our different types of plants that we have, whether or not they're monocots or dicots, and then being able to identify some of the major parts of them. So I'm going to go through our classes, um, go through parts of a seed, identifying plant parts, and then kind of how to use this information in the future. So if we look at our plant classes, we have two main classes that we're actually concerned about with most of our crops. Um, we have our dicots and our monocots. So these classes of plants fall under our angiosperms. So our angiosperms are flowering plants. We also have gymnosperms. So these are things like our pine trees, our tamaracks, um, things that do not have enclosed seeds or flowers. So um, our dicots and monocots are both angiosperms and our dicots have two cotyledons and our monocots only have one. So if we think about a dicot, then if we think about something like cotton, we've got these two little cotyledons on our plant. Um, our monocots only have one cotyledon. So we've got a few other things that are characteristics that we can look for in these plants. Um, our flowering parts and our monocots are typically in groupings of three, so three, six, nine. Um, typically, you can always have some variation in nature. We have our one cotyledon. Our leaf venation is typically parallel, so if we look at this oak plant right here, then we've got these parallel veins right here. Um, these parallel veins are very indicative of our monocots. Um, and we can also look at this corn plant and see that we've got parallel veins within this leaf um, if we look closely at it. So sometimes you'll hear dicots referred to as broadleafs. Um, and I've had some people that have thought that things like corn and grain sorghum were actually broad leaves. They're not. They have a wider leaf than, say, wheat um, or Bermuda grass, but it is still a grass plant um, or a monocot. Now, one thing that um, is unique in our monocots is how our vascular bundles are actually arranged. So our vascular system is composed of our xylem, which is transporting our water throughout our plant, and then our phloem. Our phloem is transporting um, things like our sugars or proteins throughout the plant. So our xylem is only moving in one direction. It goes from our roots up out of the leaves but our phloem can actually move any direction throughout the plant that it needs to. Um, so if we think about how our water is moving through our plant, we can kind of consider our plant like a straw. And since we have our plants in the ground, they have our roots, the roots are actually what's taking up the water throughout the soil. Um, and then what happens whenever this is actually growing, then this water is going to travel up the roots, through the xylem, and then out through these leaves into the atmosphere. So since the atmosphere is typically drier, unless it's very humid, then it's kind of, it's the sucking action. So that difference of low water in the atmosphere is actually pulling that water um, up out of the plants. So if we look at how these vascular bundles are arranged in our monocots, they're kind of just randomly distributed throughout the plant. And we're going to have um, the phloem portion of that bundle. And then we'll also have our xylem portion. And that's making up those vascular bundles because it's a bundle of that xylem and phloem. And so that xylem's pulling the water. And then your sugars are able to move throughout via the phloem. So this is kind of like our highway system of our plant getting nutrients and water throughout. So we also have our type of emergence. 
in our monocots, which is a hypogeal emergence. Um, with hypogeal emergence, our growth point of our plant is actually staying below ground. So this is um, very good in some cases for what's actually happening within our plant. When we go on and look at our dicots um, for our flower parts, they're typically in fours or fives. And our cotyledons, we do have those two primary cotyledons. And then when we look at our leaf venation, it's more of a netted venation. So um, if we have this little leaf, then instead of it running parallel, we're going to have that main mid vein. And then these side veins are going to go more at a perpendicular angled shape compared to if we had um, a grass plant where we would have that main mid rib once again and then all the rest of the veins would be parallel. So our grasses are parallel, our dicots are more of a dendritic, um, but a netted type venation. When we look at our vascular bundles in our dicots, remember we have our um, xylem transporting our water and that phloem is transporting the food. And <clears throat> in our dicot, this is actually going around in a ring on the stem. So each one of these is a vascular bundle. We have our xylem and then we have our phloem on the other portion. So remember this is, is a bundle of the xylem and phloem working together and that xylem is moving the water up and out of the plant and that phloem is moving the sugars and proteins throughout the entire plant. For our emergence on our dicots, typically an epigeal emergence. So our growth point is going to be above the soil surface as soon as these plants emerge. So let's look at this hypogeal and epigeal emergence. Our hypogeal emergence, our growth point is below the soil surface for a set amount of time, which is very dependent on the plant. Um, so this is depicting our growth point um, below ground. And some of the benefits that we can have by thinking about a hypogeal emergence and what you can actually do is say you have planted your crop and you need to go through for a post-emerge application and you start to run into the issue of maybe you kind of swerved a little bit and crushed a few plants on one row. So on something like corn, that plant is just going to regrow if it's um, less younger than a V6 growth stage. Um, and so at that point in time, that growth point is still below ground if it's younger than V6. And so you can squish this plant and it's fine. So this also helps out with um, grazing because plant animals can go by and munch on your corn or your wheat it's not going to do anything unless they're really kind of angry and pull this entire plant up out of the ground. If they pull the entire plant up out of the ground, then yes, you've lost that plant because the growth point has been removed. Um, but until then, you're fine. So we think about when this growth point moves from below the soil surface up in corn. Like I said, it's typically V6 when this growth point is above ground. For a wheat, what we're looking for is that first hollow stem for when um, this growth point's actually moved above ground. So if we look at this image here for first hollow stem, um, we're looking for that dime-sized hollow stem. If we look really closely, you can actually see the seed head um, that's coming up and emerging throughout the main stem on the sweet plant. Now, if we look at something like cotton or soybeans with our epigeal emergence, we have our two cotyledons are our growth point. Um, and as soon as this plant emerges, a seedling comes up out of the ground, those growth points are visible. They are exposed to the surface. Anything that happens can affect this plant from then on. So say we have some hogs or something else that comes by deer and they come through and kind of nibble and clip some of these plants just after they emerge. 
they clip these plants below those cotyledons, that plant is going to die. And so this is the thing that we have to worry about on the difference between a hypogeal versus an epigeal emergence. If those deer go through right after some wheat has emerged, it might set it back a little bit, but that growth point can still put out new growth. If those deer come by and clip that soybean or cotton right after it's emerged, then you're going to have a problem because at that point it's not gonna grow anymore. So those are the things that we're worried about. Um, this is why cotton is also much more sensitive to freezes because if it freezes and dies back, it's dead. If corn was planted a little early and it froze and died back, then you're just gonna get new growth coming up out of that growth point. So the next part that I wanna look, look at um, is what is a seed and kind of what makes it up. So we can think of a seed kind of as a um, miniature plant that's kind of frozen in time or dormant and our seed is composed of three main parts. So we have our embryo, our endosperm, and our seed coat. Our embryo is our baby plant and our endosperm um, is actually the food that this baby plant is going to consume until it can start photosynthesis. And then our seed coat is our protective layer. So these are the three main parts that our seeds actually have. So we have our embryo here and our dicot seed. And if we look closely at the parts, there's only gonna be one. There's two here to show the parts. Um, but for this embryo, our epicotyls right here, these are our first true leaves. So either half of this bean seed right here is actually what's, um, either half of this bean seed right here is what's going to be the, the cotyledons whenever this plant actually emerges. But this embryo is composed of our first true leaves. Our hypocotyl right here is what actually becomes the stem and then our radical is the root of our plant. So our radical is always the first thing that emerges, whether it's a dicot or a monocot. Um, in our dicots, the radical actually becomes the taproot, and in our monocots, the radical is going to die after a certain amount of time because in our monocot systems, um, our root systems, are actually fibrous roots. So if this is our plant, then this little surface, then we've got these fibrous roots below ground um, that are putting on all this growth. Probably not quite this crazy. Um, but no one root is larger than the other. Where if we look at our dicot, then we've got this primary tap root here. And this primary tap root at one point was that radical whenever this plant emerged. And then you have these smaller adventitious roots coming off the side of this primary tap root. So we have this primary tap root in things like our canola, our soybeans, our cotton, um, alfalfa. All of our dicots have this primary tap root. If you look at something like canola, it has a very large tap root, or it can. Um, I know a lot of people are very interested in tillage radish, and so we can get some of those similar properties of that kind of tillage biotiller from that root for some of our other dicots as well because they are putting down that primary tap root um, into that soil system. If we look at our parts on our monocot, um, our endosperm is our primary food storage for our grasses. So if we think about um, <clears throat> a corn seedling, then when you typically look at a corn kernel, um, there's kind of a caved in triangular side to the front of it. This portion, when you look at this, is actually the embryo, so it doesn't quite have this odd diagonal shape going that way. Um, but if you cut this down this way, then you would see it kind of at that angle. Um, within our embryo, we have our epicotyl or plumule. This is the first kind of 
true leaf that's coming out in our grass. We also have our radical, that's that root that's going to come out, that's your primary root that's then going to die because our monocots are fibrous. Um, and then we also have the seed coat that's protecting. So once these seed coats actually start to take in water, there's enzymes that break down that let it know that it's time to start germinating. Okay, so if we look at this germination, um, for our germination, we've got the first step is going to be our seed actually imbibing water. So when the seed starts to imbibe water, that water is going to start breaking down the seed coat. When that water starts to break down the seed coat, it actually starts releasing certain enzymes that tell this plant that it's time to start emerging. Um, about one to two days after planting, then we also get our colriza starting to emerge and our radical is going to be our first thing that actually comes out of our seed. And this radical or our root is going to start to, to anchor down the seedling so that it can actually stay stable whenever it's trying to grow. Our coleoptile is right here, so this is going to continue to elongate. If we take a better look at this, um, you've probably seen this and maybe just not been aware of it, but there's kind of this protective sheath that's on our wheat seedlings as they emerge. This is actually our coleoptile. So this is protecting this first leaf um, as it emerges. So this coleoptile is kind of taking the brunt of the force as it's emerging through the soil, any diseases or nicks that it takes to try to protect that first leaf so it can get it up out of the soil without harming it. Um, <clears throat> When we look, we've got our seminal roots forming. So right here, we've got some of our seminal roots. Um, and then as this plant continues to grow, then we will see that in corn, our mesocotyl is actually going to start to elongate. We're gonna get that first internode. Um, that's staying inactive in our wheat, barley, and rye. So we can kind of think of this is giving the ability to keep getting tillering occurring within these plants. Um, and then one of the last things that we're going to look at as far as germination steps is then we're actually going to start to get some crown roots forming that these are going to really give some good structure and stability to this plant. If we look at our legumes, um, we have a similar start. We're going to start having that seed coat broken down. And once that happens, those enzymes are going to start to let that plant know it's time to actually start to germinate. Um, at that point, we've got our hypocotyl that's going to start um, elongating. So this portion right here is our hypocotyl, pretty much down to wherever we've got stem ending. Um, then at about four to six days after planting, we start to have our hypocotylinary arch start to straighten. So what's happening, what's really important with this hypocotylinary arch is it's what's breaking through the soil for our seedlings for things like cor or sorry, not cotton. Cotton, soybeans, our dicots. So we get this arch, if we think of this as our soil surface, then this arch is going to break through that soil surface, and sometimes people will refer to the neck breaking on a plant. So this hypocotylinary arch, um, this is the neck, and so we want to make sure that that soil is soft enough that we don't have a crust, so that, that hypocotylinary arch can just pop right through and let those um, cotyledons come out and start to unfurl. So our cotyledons actually unfolding is this next step. So we have our cotyledons here. Our cotyledons are not leaves. They are just that um, food source for this plant as it's starting to grow. So all of those carbs, oils, um, are stored in those cotyledons. After that, we then start to get our first true leaves starting to unfurl. So this is a filled bean plant. Um, these first true leaves in our legumes are actually unifoliate. So there's only one leaf. 
Um, whereas after that, our trifoliate leaves are going to start to form. Our trifoliates, you have three leaflets that are actually making up one leaf. So if we think about a soybean, then we have our three little leaflets that are making up one leaf. So this would actually be attached to the plant here. This is all one leaf composed of three individual leaflets. And those are our trifoliate leaves. So we definitely need to be careful with our seeds. We don't want to damage our, in, um, our embryo or our germ. So our germ is another phrase that you might hear for the embryo. Um, our grasses can have some damage to the endosperm without damaging the embryo. And so can dicots, but you definitely got to be careful that that embryo doesn't break or get damaged. So these are things that you want to think about as far as storage of seeds that you're not getting damage to these, um, or even whenever you're transferring seeds, maybe going from the silo to the hopper, moving through those augers, you don't want it too tight or too many seeds in there at once to start crushing those and potentially damaging that embryo. So um, all of this, um, you've gotta be careful even if it's a drill and making sure that the openings on that drill going down to the seed tubes is open enough for whatever size seed that you have that you're not crushing those seeds as they go through. So we've just got to be able to handle our seeds without actually damaging that embryo portion. So now we're going to look at our plant morphology. So this is plant morphology is the study of plant structures, um, study of how stems, leaves, flowers, and roots actually differ among our different plants. And so what we're going to do is primarily look at just the shoot portion of our plants, whether or not that's our grasses or our dicots. So our shoot includes our stems, our leaves, and our inflorescence. So our inflorescence is really just kind of a fancy word for flowers. Um, so if we think about that, um, here's some Indian grass. This is the inflorescence for this plant. So this is the flowers um, of our Indian grass. So for both of these, we're going to look at our monocots and dicots. So first we're going to look at a grass plant. So if we look at our grass plant, then we're going to see some key things here. We have our inflorescence, this seed head. Um, right on that seed head, we have a spike. So one little um, kind of seedling area is going to be an individual spike. Right here, we kind of have one spike and or spikelet. This entire seed head, if we're thinking about something like wheat or barley, um, that is a spike type inflorescence. Now, the next portion of our grass plant that we're going to look at is our collar region. So, our collar region is the portion of our plant where our leaf blade is actually meeting the leaf sheath. So if we look at this on our corn, we've got our leaf blade here. This is our leaf blade. We've got our collar region is the juncture of this leaf blade and the actual leaf sheath. So our leaf sheath is what's wrapping around our stem of our grass. And so we've got the blade, the sheath, and then this juncture where these two meet is actually the collar. So we can see that we've got a pretty broad white collar on this corn plant. So <clears throat> the reason why our collar region is so important is because we have these different attributes. So we have our ligules, which our ligules are on the back side of this leaf blade. Um, we have different types of ligules. They can be membranous, so it's kind of like a clear um, membrane. We can also have hairy, so it just looks like a fringe of hairs. 
or it might not have ligules at all. Then we can have auricles, which are auricles are kind of like these um, ear-like appendages that stick out the front of this collar region. So these auricles can be very long, they might be very short and stubby, or they might not be there altogether. So barnyard grass is one of our major weeds. And in barnyard grass, if we think about it, it's one of our grasses. It has no ligules and it has no auricles. So it's our only summer annual grass without any ligules and without any auricles. So that's a feature that we can look at to determine, oh, that's barnyard grass because it's missing both of the, those, especially if we don't have our seed head yet. Once we get our seed head, it's much easier to tell our plants, but if this is missing, then we can use this collar region to actually determine what grass it is. Another feature that we have on our blade, our leaf blade, is a midrib. So if we take a look once again at this corn plant, um, this midrib is this very broad, kind of whitish color on this leaf. So that is the midrib of that grass plant this corn. Then we've got some other features that we can have. Um, our leaf buds, when this plant is growing, can actually be either rolled, so in a circular fashion, in a spiral, or folded, so kind of like you would fold paper up. So it's either going to be rolled inside or folded. So that's another way that we can determine what grass it is based on how that leaf bud is actually um, contained within the sheep as it starts to come out. Other things that we can have in our grasses, we can have underground stems or rhizomes, so we're going to get growth off of that. We can also have above ground stems, <clears throat> which are our stolons, and then our tillers are coming off of this main plant, but still a mechanism of more growth. Um, so our wheat tillers, we can have, really we can have tillers in any of our grasses. You don't typically have tillering in corn unless something has happened, um, but we will get tillering in grain sorghum, we get tillering in wheat, um, and barley. And then these stolons, are above ground features. So things like Bermuda grass travel via stolons. So if you kind of pull up a whole runner of Bermuda, um, you'll have the stolons, those above ground stems connecting all of that. If we think about something like Johnson grass, we have that underground rhizome that's also acting as storage. Um, that's just another dispersal mechanism for our grasses. So if we think about something like Johnson grass, it's one of the issues if you go in through and till up a field, you've pretty much just spread Johnson grass all over the place via that rhizome. So to go through some of these as far as the definition is concerned, the vernation is how that leaf is actually shaped in the growing point. So that vernation um, is whether or not that leaf is curled up or if it's folded inside. The ligules are, <clears throat> the, they're on the inner side of the leaf. I kind of think as the ligules kind of is kind of, if you pop up your collar, you've got a collared shirt on, it's on the inside of that leaf and typically um, it can either be arched, it can be pointed, um, it can either be the fringe of hairs that's there. So there's a lot of different types of ligules we can have. We can also have our oracles that are like little earlobes. Um, they're located at the bottom of that leaf blade where it meets the actual leaf sheath. The collar is that junction. And then the, the leaf bud is also kind of how that newly formed leaf is arranged within that actual leaf sheath. So here's our vernation. Um, on an actual live plant. So here we can see we've got a very folded vernation compared to this 
grass plant right here where it's rolled up inside. Um, if we take a closer look at our collars and some of our different crops, we have our wheat right here. We've got somewhat longer oracles with very small fringe hairs on them. Um, we do have a pretty large um, ligule on the back side. We can see this ligule is wrapping around that main stem and all of this is where the leaf blade actually meets the leaf sheath. This is that collar region. Our rye has pretty much non-existent um, oracles and a very short ligule. Barley though, um, it's pretty much been attributed. If you think about barley, the oracles, you should be able to see them from 20 feet away. So our barley oracles are very large, they're clasping, but they don't have any hairs. Now, this is not to say that we can't have different biotypes. So we can have differences in our plants depending on where they're originally from. And I have grown some barley that has pretty short, stubby oracles, smaller or the same size as wheat. So we can have some differences. Um, our oats, we have no oracles, um, but we do have a very large ligule. On triticale, we have clasping oracles that are also fringed in hairs. We have a pretty continuous um, flat top truncated ligule going around the back. So this is what I was talking about. Um, this is actually the barley plant that I grew in the greenhouse. So if we look at that drawing, it showed very large clasping oracles on our barley, but this is a barley plant that we grew and you can see that it has more stubby oracles, but they still don't have any hair on them, which they're not supposed to. And then, <coughs> excuse me, um, we can see the ligule wrapping around that main stem of the grass plant. So our lower oracles kind of like the earlobes and our ligules are like the collar and all of this is within that collar region of our grasses. After looking at our monocot, now if we look at our dicot, we can see a few different features. So first going to look at our axillary buds. Um, these axillary buds right here, <coughs> this is located at a node on our plant. This axillary bud is going to either develop into a branch or our leaves or a flower. So at this axillary bud is actually a node. Um, in between two nodes is our internode. And there's some other features that we can look at. Um, our leaves, there's a few terms that can be helpful. Um, our leaf margin, we can have different types of margins, whether it's serrated like it is here. Um, our mid vein instead of our mid rib, like on our grasses. And then our petiole. So if we think about maybe we've had some insect damage and you're like, they chewed on the stem. So, well, did they chew on the actual stem of the plant or did they chew the petiole of our leaf? Um, there's a few ways that that can help because it can start to kind of tell us maybe what type of insect or disease would actually cause that. Um, something else that's kind of interesting and fun with our dicots is our terminal bud actually has a lot of control over our plant. So this terminal bud is actually releasing a hormone over the rest of the plant telling these axillary buds not to put on extra stem growth or branching. Um, and so because of that, this is referred to as a Christmas tree effect. So if we think about a Christmas tree, it has a nice pyramid shape to it. And so this terminal bud at the top is actually releasing this hormone that's telling the rest of this plant to stay dormant. And so that's why at the top of our plant, we have this more tapered shape. And the further away you get from the top, we get a wider base because there's less of that hormone telling those lower branches not to grow. So if we think about that, I think it's pretty spiffy that we have pyramid shaped Christmas trees and not a lot of rectangles everywhere. Um, if we look, our node is actually where this leaf or flower emerges. Um, 
can see we've got some soybeans here that were in my teaching demos that the deer enjoyed as well too and they still grew pretty well I wouldn't be happy with the yields if I was actually taking them to yield but those deer definitely had their fill um, and then we have this inner node region between the two so if we look at this as we go around um, we can see that we have the internode area, we have these flowers located here, and then each one of these <clears throat> leaf petioles that are actually coming off of this plant. So we can look a little bit further at some more leaf morphology. Um, this whole thing is our blade, then we have the margin um, and our petiole. We can have some of our leaves actually have stipules. They're nearly like little ear-like appendages on either side of where the petiole attaches to um, your main stem. You can also have some leaves that have no petiole whatsoever, and so they would be sessile or we can have a clasping base. So our mustards, our canola, our shepherd's purse, um, all of those have a clasping base where the bottom of that leaf actually clasps around that stem. If we look closer at a legume leaf, this is a compound leaf. So a compound leaf has more than one part to it. Um, so we've got three individual leaflets actually making up one compound leaf. We then still have that petiole and then stipules. So we've got a lot of stipules on our um, legumes. This is one of the features that we can use to tell apart our different clovers, um, to tell apart some of our different um, mung beans or guar. They look very different, but we can also still look at that stipule and they are extremely different when we start to look at those features. Um, here we have our green mung bean and so this part right here is actually the stipule and so on our green mung bean I actually think it kind of looks like a little elf ear. It's pointed, um, it's very broad and flat and so it's a very distinct stipule on our green mung beans. We've also got some stink bugs hanging out. As we move on to our inflorescence, um, this is the flowering portion of our plant. So this is the seed heads on our grasses and flowers on our cotton, soybeans, and alfalfa. We've got a few different types of inflorescence that are pretty common. We have a spike where our spikelets are directly attached to a central stalk. So these are things like wheat or rye. Um, we have a raceme, so this is where our spikelets are actually attached to a central stalk by a main smaller stalk, um, that's our pedicel. And so on a raceme, um, we've got that main stalk, but then we have all of these pedicels coming off of that as well. So we can think of things like our alfalfa, our sweet clover, and soybeans, um, where they're attached directly to that stalk. We then also have a panicle. So a very common panicle um, is our green sorghum. So we've got spikelets that are actually attached to pedicels, and those pedicels are then attached at the panicle branch, and then your panicle branch is attached to the rachis. So this is that main panicle branch right here, main panicle branch that's attached to the rachis at that point. Um, so it's it just kind of gets to smaller portions. Um, another common panicle that we see that's not actually where the seeds are, but it's our corn tassel. So this is also considered a panicle. Um, our flowering heads are commonly used for a lot of our different flower types. Um, but it's where we've got flowers that are clustered or attached um, to a very, sh typically it can be either elongated or shortened receptacle. And so things like red and white clover as well as sunflowers are both head inflorescence. So if we take a look at this closer, 
Um, we've got our soybeans are on a raceme. Our canola, remember, is also a raceme. And then we've got something like a spike right here. So our barley, wheat, and rye are all spikelets. Um, our head type inflorescence are our red clover, sunflowers, and white clover. And then our panicles. So it can be our oats, rice, sorghum, corn tassel. Um, things that are helpful if we take a step back and look at these other inflorescence types that can be helpful when we have these umbels. Um, an umbel is something like our, our parsley family has umbels and knowing the type of inflorescence can really help us differentiate between something that could potentially be highly toxic and something that's not highly toxic and that we can actually eat. So if we look more specifically, um, this is water hemlock. Water hemlock is the most poisonous plant in North America and if you're not familiar with it, it can look somewhat similar to wild carrot. Wild carrot is also known as Queen Anne's Lace. Um, but you do have differences. Wild carrot is an umbel, but water hemlock is actually a compound umbel. So it has little individual mini umbels making up that entire flower head. Um, another thing is whenever if I cut this off the plant, our water hemlock will actually retain that shape. Whereas if I cut um, the wild carrot off of its plant, it's going to cup up and they call it a bird's nest. So it cups up and rounds and our water hemlock does not do that. We also have this little black flower that you'll find in all of your wild carrots. So sometimes yeah, it's good to know our crops, but it can also be really good to know if you've got a highly toxic plant, maybe where your children or animals are playing near. So, and there was our canola for a raceme as well. So let's take a closer look at our parts of our grass inflorescence. Um, we have our palea, our stamen, pistil, lemma, and on. So if we take a look at this picture, um, our palea is actually this inner part. Um, and then our lemma is the outer portion. Our lemma also has the on attached. All of our lemma and palea are actually protecting our grass inflorescence portion. So um, our actual anther where all of the pollen is contained and then the stigma style and ovaries. So when we look at our parts of our flowers, our anther and our filament are part of the stamen. The stamen is the male portion of our flowers. The stigma style and ovary are the female. These are also referred to as the pistil. Um, this is the female portion of our flowers. So we can look at this in a live plant. So we have this lemma is the outer portion that actually would have the on attached to it. The palea is kind of covering the top, if we think of that. Um, and then after this has already been actually fertilized, this ovule is actually going to grow in to the grain, and so that is the seed, that is the ovule of that flower. Um, we can also see this in another diagram where we have our entire spikelet that can be made up of multiple florets or individual flowers. Um, some of those might be sterile, but each one we're going to have that outer lemma where the on is attached, the kernel that's inside, and then that palea um, that does not have an on portion. The glooms are an outer protective layer at the very base of the spikelet. So we've been through quite a bit of material, and you might be wondering why does any of this matter? Um, there's quite a few different reasons when we start to think about different terminology. We might be talking about the stem of a plant and you're saying that the insect was chewing on the stem when in fact it might have been chewing on the petiole of the leaf. Um, and so where that damage occurs on a plant can really start to differentiate maybe how much yield is being lost or what 
other issues you might worry about for diseases kind of infecting that plant. Um, that terminology of that outer kind of margin of our leaves can also start to help on things like our diseases, our nutrient deficiencies, where that deficiency is occurring on the leaf. You might say the leaf is yellow, but is the leaf yellow going down the midrib or is the leaf yellow on the outside edge or is the leaf yellow all over? So all of these things can really help out with differentiating and determining what's actually going on within your field. Um, <clears throat> there also might be things like if we look at our spikelets that we just looked at and you're like, there's been damage to the spikelet. Well, is it just superficial on the lemma or the palea or have you actually had damage to the grain itself? So all of these things can really help out with what's going on and um, what what needs to be done. So with that, um, I hope that we've got a little bit more confidence about parts of our plants and um, some of our basics. So with that, enjoy. And here's my contact information if you have any other questions. Um, I look forward to hearing from y'all and um, Hope y'all have a great day.